the Oak Hills Community Church. I'm glad to see all of y'all here. Some folks over here may be a little bit more worried about COVID than y'all are over here. They are really spreading out over there. <laughs> Isn't it funny how we get in our habits of sitting in the same place or, or going to the same restaurants? Uh, you know, sometimes when Kelly and I, we, we decide to go out for lunch, like, okay, where are we going? Well, the usual Monday spot, I guess. So, <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, enough of that. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and stand and start our service with singing Victory in Jesus.
have a seat, and I have to ask uh, the folks in the back, I think I forgot to turn on the stream for Facebook. Did you guys get it? Perfect. So welcome those of you who are on Facebook. Uh, again, uh, I, I just need more people, or more, or more of me, then I could get more done, couldn't I? Well, I'll tell you what, we don't have any announcements, or should I say, the announcements this morning include Thomas is not here to do announcements, and we don't have any, uh, except that if memory serves, December 6th, we're going to be doing things a lot different. Um, the, the Nest, the children's group, as well as the Mother's Day Out and a couple other groups, they're taking over on that Sunday morning. And so I, last I heard and talked to Suzanne, I believe they're going to do three shorter uh, services with the kids doing the service. And they're going to have stuff outside, uh, live nativity, manned by the little kids. It's going to be cool. So th also there's going to be a lot of people because all the folks, you know, that have kids in the nest in the Mother's Day Out program, they're going to be here um, the, the, the other groups that are joining us, their parents are going to be here, thus the three shorter services. So plan to be here because it's going to be fun. And uh, if you don't like kids, well, there's something wrong with you and you can just stay away that Sunday because it's going to be it's going to be kids all day everywhere. Uh, so that'll be great. Um, and so now that you're aware of that, that includes all the unscheduled announcements. And uh, so we're going to go ahead and, I'm sorry? Uh, not as far as you know, Todd. We did not have announcements. Um, so <laughs> um, let's, let's have a word of prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for the joy of music, for the, the privilege to be able to come to your throne of grace and worship you. And, and Father, we pray that as, as we worship you in music and we hear the message this morning, that uh, we would come out of here more like you than we are now. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, if you're able, if you have the leg strength, you go ahead and stand with us. We're going to continue singing. We're going to start with Your Grace is Enough. If you have to sit down, that's okay.
variante.
exalted, the great and wonderful God, the creator of the universe and all that's in it. We thank you for, for that. We thank you also for the privilege of being able to come to your throne in this time of worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And y'all can have a seat. <clears throat> um, Savannah, would you push button number two there on the light setting behind you on the wall? As usual, we're going to have our time of pray, prayer in our service, and we have a couple of folks I know we need to pray for. Uh, I don't know if many of you saw the update on Gene Getz, but he is doing better. Um, he had to go back to the hospital earlier in the week. Um, they thought it was sepsis, but apparently not. But they are not sure, I guess, what exactly was going on. But he got his appetite back within a couple of days, and he was getting stronger. Still in the hospital at this time, so continue to pray for Gene. Also, uh, Joe is going in for an MRI. Um, I forget what day you told me, Wednesday, uh, he's got a pinched nerve and he can't get comfortable at all. Uh, so pray for him. And then Michaela, who normally plays bass for us, is not here today because her dad had knee surgery on Wednesday. Her dad's name is David. And he apparently, they think the anesthesia has affected his brain and he's not able to string together full sentences. Uh, he did not recognize her on a video chat yesterday. And so she, um, she and, and her husband, Jared, are not here today with us. But we need to pray for all these folks. Um, and I'm sure you have folks in mind that you want to lift up to the Lord. And so you do that while I pray for these. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of bringing our cares to you, to the very throne of grace. Father, we pray that uh, as, we, as we lift up these folks, they would be comforted by your Holy Spirit. Father, we pray that you would uh, touch Joe, give him comfort as he goes about his day between now and Wednesday relieve the pain from the, the pinched nerve. But Father, we pray that you would help the doctors to know how to treat uh, this and that he might be just out of pain, no longer be in that situation. We pray for, pray for David, Father, that you would heal his mind. Um, pray for the comfort of the family, uh, Father, that you would help them to deal with this whole situation. We pray, Father, that you would bring his mind back quickly, uh, that they might not have to uh, be in such a state of, of uh, worry, I guess, uh, for, for very long at all. And we pray for Gene, Father, that you would continue to heal him. Father, I, I, uh, I just pray that you would, you, you would heal him up and get him out of the hospital, get him home, that he might be, uh, be able to spend his days with Elaine, his wife. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Pastor Mark, I think you have a quiz for us or something, right? At a A pen. Easy to remember. It looks like the number one, right? Number two is a coat hanger. And you just picture the coat hanger coming around like, like this. It resembles the number two. Number three, anybody remember what that one is? 
Tricycle, why a tricycle? Three wheels. Can you guess what number four is? A, a car, right, because of four tires. Now, number five is a $5 bill. Number six is a little tougher. If you will imagine a monkey, and that monkey is sitting on a bar, and below the bar, his tail hangs down, and the tail curls around, what does it look like? The number six. Number seven is an upside down golf putter. You have the shaft and you have the top of the putter resembling a seven. Number eight, Art's favorite, an eight ball. Right, he loves pool. <laughs> Number nine is a periscope. You have the the shaft of the periscope coming out of the water and the, the ocular piece at the top makes it resemble the number nine. And finally, 10 is 10 little Indians. So now it's your turn. Here's that time for that quiz. What's number one? Three. Car. $5 bill, monkey's tail, putter, right? Number eight, eight ball. Number nine, periscope. And number 10. Great. You guys are good. Give yourselves a hand. All right. Now I want to show you what you need to do is attach bits of information to this. And because you have this list that is a sequence, you always are able to follow the sequence. And frankly, it's a great way to remember things. Now, I gotta tell you, I have a memory like Swiss cheese. It's very selective. I can remember some things that nobody knows why I remember them, and other things. I tried to remember where I went on vacation this summer, I couldn't remember. It was Durango, by the way. Um, so let me, let me give you an illustration. Say I'm driving in the car and my wife knows that I'm going to the grocery store. And she calls me up and she says, I want you to get several things while you're at the grocery store. Well, I can't write it down, I'm driving, right? So she tells me, I use this memory peg system, I really do. And say she wants me to get a jug of milk, a loaf of bread, and some eggs. More than once, when I think I'll remember, I get home and I got some items and she says, yeah, but where is so-and-so? <laughs> so when I use this memory peg system, it's a great help. Picture it this way, I'm driving and I don't have time to write it down, so I just remember number one is a jug of milk. So I imagine one of those big pens and I take out the insides and I put it in the jug of milk, and I remember it. Sounds silly, but it works. Number two is a loaf of bread, so I've got a coat hanger, the number two, and I'll hang that loaf of bread over the coat hanger. Makes a mess of the bread, but I remember it. And number three, how am I going to remember eggs and a tricycle? I picture this giant egg riding a tricycle. You laugh, but you'll remember it. I don't have to do anything else, and tonight, if I go shopping, I won't forget these things because they're attached to the pegs. So now what we're going to do, and some of you are relatively new, some of you have been through the whole series, but we're going to attach one last time the periods of the Old Testament to the memory pegs. Let's begin. Number one. The period of beginnings. When God speaks, something happens. Psalm 33 says, For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. When you consider the acts of God recorded in Genesis 1, you can't help 
but bow in reverential worship. For his creative acts reveal a God of power and wisdom whose word carries authority. Here's the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. All right, opening verse of the Bible in the beginning. It's the period of beginnings. So to remember this, we picture a fountain pen with the world spinning on it. You can remember that. We talked about the first day. Let's go down to the last day of creation, day number six. It's a day of creation of land animals and mankind. So Genesis 1. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground, and the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. The verb for make or formed is used to picture somebody creating a work of art. And friends, when God made us, that's what he made. Our bodies are a work of art. It took the God of the Bible, the God who knows all things, who is incredibly wise, to dream it up. And the God of power, who has all power to make our bodies, to make us. And further, it says that let us make mankind in our image. It sounds like a group, doesn't it? Sounds like deliberation going on, discussion. Well, this can't be God talking with the angels. We're not made in the image of angels. We're made in God's image. So when it says, let us make mankind in our image, from the very first chapter, we get a glimpse of the Trinity of God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Revealed in the Old Testament, made even more clear in the New. Well, God gave us personality, being made in the image of God, minds to think with, emotions to feel with, and a will for making decisions. But he also gave us an inner spiritual nature that enables us to know and worship him. The image of God in men and women, it's been marred by sin. But it can be renewed when we place our faith in God's Son, Jesus Christ. Now God reveals his purpose, his plan for mankind, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, over all the creatures that move along the ground. God is king of the universe, and his kingdom is eternal. But the amazing things, friends, is that he wants to share that rule with you and me. Wow. That's just amazing. He wants to make us his junior partners. He wants us to share in what he's doing. And when Christ comes back, he's going to implement that. And men and women in Christ 
have an opportunity to rule and reign under, of course, the King of Kings. I just can't get over that. We can rule and reign with Christ. Well, how do beliefs about creation impact the rest of theology? <laughs> Much of Christian theology is based on the historical accuracy of the Genesis account. God created. He created mankind, male and female. They did not evolve from a lower form of life. Male and female. The image is found in the type of relationship that was designed to exist between male and female human beings, a relationship where the characteristics of each sex are valued and used to form a oneness in their identity and purpose. The concept of marriage comes right out of the creation account, Genesis 2 and is referenced by Jesus in all three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Our Lord himself acknowledges that man was created male and female from the beginning of creation. These statements, to be comprehensible, rely on the historical accuracy of the creation account in Genesis. So period number one is the period of beginnings. The first 11 chapters of Genesis deal with humanity in general and focus on four great events. Creation, fall, flood, and Babel. The rest of Genesis, starting in chapter 12, focuses on the creation of God's next plan the creation of the nation of Israel. In doing this, he focuses on four individuals, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. We call these individuals the patriarchs because they are the fathers of the Israelite nation. So we have the memory peg. There you see a a coat. Imagine Abraham, the first patriarch, taking off his robe and hanging it on a hanger. That will help us to remember number two is the period of the patriarchs. As you study Genesis, keep in mind that Moses didn't write a detailed history of persons and events. He was selective in what he gave. He only gave that information that he needed for us to know about in order to describe God's beginnings of these particular things. The period of the patriarchs begins with Abraham. God made a covenant. A covenant is like a contract, only more personal. It's between persons. And these individuals who know each other, they make an agreement beforehand, and then they ratify that agreement. Now, there are two kinds of covenants in the Bible. One is a conditional covenant. And that is between two people, and they both agree to certain things. And if anybody breaks their part of the bargain, doesn't fulfill what they've committed to, the other person is not required to fulfill it. So this kind of covenant can be broken. But then there's the other kind. It is the unconditional covenant or unilateral covenant. And in this particular covenant, only one person is guaranteeing that the government is in force. And who's the one person? God. And when God makes a promise, you can bank on it. You can count on it happening. When he makes a covenant with Abraham, which is for Abraham and for Israel and even all posterity, all of us, it's not dependent on us being faithful. It's dependent on God being faithful. 
And that's something we can count on. Let me show you how we know this. In Genesis chapter 12, God begins to deal not with the whole world, but with his new beginnings of a nation. And he calls Abraham. And he makes certain commitments to Abraham. And the three foremost of those commitments are land, seed, and blessing. The land of Israel, the seed being the promised persons who become the Jewish people, and ultimately Christ. Land, seed, and blessing. And the blessing that comes through Jesus Christ. From the very beginning, from the first book, we begin to see inklings of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So God begins to reveal in chapter 12, but in chapter 15, they have the ratification. And God says to Abraham, Abraham, go make sacrifices and divide those animals in half. And he didn't have to explain this to Abraham. He understood the idea of covenant. And so he arranges the carcasses of the animals in a pathway. And typically, two people would walk through, perhaps arm in arm, together, walking through the carcasses. And the idea was, we're both in this. We're both responsible for this. And by the way, if you don't fulfill your end of the bargain, may you be like that dead meat right there. Talk about graphic. But what happened? When Abraham had done what he needed to do with the carcasses, God put him into a deep sleep. And God and God alone walked through and made that covenant. God is committing himself saying, I am the only one who's responsible for fulfilling this covenant. And so we can count on this. We know it's true. God promised the promises of land, seed, and blessing. And even to this day, they're still in vogue. Well, now we come to period number three, the Egyptian period. Remember what the memory peg is for three? Tricycle. And you have the Egyptian period. So you have an Egyptian here riding on this tricycle The Egyptian is supposed to be Pharaoh, (laughs) if you can picture that. The Egyptian period is a story of migration. You had Abraham, who had Isaac. Isaac had Jacob. And Jacob had a son named Joseph. Joseph was the 11th of 12 sons, and they had one daughter. Genesis chapter 37 through chapter 50 tell the story of Joseph. We see Joseph as a 17-year-old returning from shepherding the flock with his half-brothers to give his father Jacob a bad report about his older brothers. How do you think that sat with the older brothers? That little tattletale. And then we also see the father showing preference for his beloved son. This son, Joseph, was his firstborn from his beloved wife, Rachel. And so he really loved this child more than the rest. Not something we should do as parents. And he made it known by making a richly ornamented robe for Joseph. I am sure that did not sit well with the other brothers. And then finally... God gives Joseph some dreams. And Joseph reveals the content of those dreams to his brothers, which was that he would one day rule over his entire family. I mean, they really hated him now. So on another day, the father sends this son, the 17-year-old boy, out to check up on the older brothers. And they see him coming. And in their hatred, 
in the heat of the moment, they make a decision. And long story short, they take this boy and they sell him as a slave. Caravan takes this young man to Egypt. There in Egypt, God begins to bless him and he begins to prosper even so. But yet, one more bad thing happened. Somebody made a false accusation about Joseph and he lands in prison in the inner security. While there, he encounters two other prisoners who were there who were formerly high up in the Pharaoh's household. One was a cupbearer. And the cupbearer is going, whoa, I just, I had this dream and I can't get it out of my mind and I wish I knew what this dream meant. And Joseph said, don't all interpretations belong to God? Tell me the dream. And he does. And he tells him, this is the interpretation. In three days, you will be restored as cupbearer to Pharaoh. But when this happens, be sure and tell him about me. And guess what? It happened. Three days later, he is restored as cupbearer. But did he remember this young man? No. I mean, why bother the king about this prisoner? Until sometime later, Pharaoh has a dream. And he can't get this dream out of his mind. And the cup bearer says, I know a guy. <laughs> Pharaoh sends for him. And Joseph gets cleaned up. He comes before Pharaoh. And he tells the content of Pharaoh's dream. He explains it to him and says, this is what your dream means. You had seven fat cows, healthy. Those stand for seven years of prosperity. All the land is going to prosper. The fields are going to give a bountiful harvest. But then there are seven gaunt cows. And the seven gaunt cows eat up the seven fat cows. And he explains, there's going to be seven years of famine. And that famine will wipe out all the good years. So if it pleased Pharaoh, he should appoint somebody who is wise to steward all of this so that grain can be saved up so that we not starve. And Pharaoh looks at him and he says, you know, there's nobody in the land as wise as you. You're going to be that guy. You're going to be number two in all of Egypt, probably the most powerful nation on earth at that time. Well, the famine extended all the way to Canaan. And Joseph is back there with his brothers, thinking that, I'm sorry, Jacob is back there with his sons, thinking that his son Joseph has died. But he's got a famine on his hands. He's got wives and kids to support. And he says to the boys, go to Egypt, take some money, buy some grain. So they travel to Egypt. And who do they encounter but their brother, now grown up, Speaking Egyptian, they didn't know who he was. And he tests them. And finally, they confess to the sin of selling their brother. And they genuinely repent. Once he knows the repentance is genuine, he reveals himself to his brothers. And they're aghast. They're just, I can't believe it. And he comforts them. He says, don't be angry with yourselves. And then later, when they're afraid that he may take his vengeance, he says to them, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. He sent me ahead of you to save you. And he was right. And so the people go get their father and all their family, their wives, their children. He says, bring them here because there's still years left of the famine. We don't want you to starve. Bring him here. I'll put you in the land of Goshen, this area in the Nile Delta that is plentiful and it'll be a wonderful place for the herds and I'll be able to watch over you there. But they always remembered the land of Canaan 
They remembered the promise of God, and they wanted to return. But then one day, another Pharaoh rises who didn't know Joseph and didn't care about how Joseph had helped his people, Egypt. And he only sees an opportunity to use these as slave labor. He has grandiose building projects he wants to do, and he can enslave the Hebrew people who have multiplied, who are now enough people to be a nation. And as they suffer under the lash of the taskmaster, they cry out to God, Oh Lord, look upon us with favor. Save us. And God being gracious, he sends a deliverer. He sends Moses. And after going head to head with the king of Egypt, finally after the ten plagues, the Pharaoh says, leave, depart. And God even puts it on the heart of the individuals in Egypt to give the, Egypt, to give the Jewish people gifts, so paying them for the time that they had spent as slaves. Abraham's family had remained in Egypt for about 400 years. But God is faithful. He makes promises. At times, those promises may seem like they will never materialize. But take heart, God cannot lie. And he will not let even one promise fall to the ground. Now we come to the wilderness wandering period. And the memory peg for this is a car, only we're going to change it a little bit. We're going to make the memory peg a dune buggy because they're in the wilderness, in the desert, (laughs) okay? And here you have a couple of Jewish guys riding in this dune buggy. And so they're in the wilderness wandering period. During the 40-year journey of the Hebrews from Egypt to Canaan, Moses went to Mount Sinai to fast and commune with Yahweh God for 40 days. There, he received the Ten Commandments from Yahweh. However, while Moses was gone, the people began to worry, where is this guy? And so Aaron said, bring me your gold. And he fashioned an idol out of the gold. When Moses came down from the mountain, he saw what had happened. He became so angry, he took the Ten Commandments written on stone with the finger of God, and in a rage, he throws it down and smashes the tablets. He grinds the idol to dust, throws it in the water, and makes the people drink it. Later, he went back up to God with stone tablets, and God engraved another set of the Ten Commandments. And God brought them out of their 40-year wandering. But the thing that caused their 40-year vacation in the desert was their lack of faith. The wilderness wandering refers to the plight of the Israelites due to their disobedience and unbelief. The Lord delivered his people from Egyptian bondage as described. They were to take possession of the land God had promised their forefathers, a land flowing with milk and honey. Prior to entry, however, they became convinced they could not eject the occupants of that land, even though God said they could with his help. And so they disobey God, and as a result, after many episodes of unbelief, and disobedience, God sentences them to 40 years in the desert. So what we've seen is that God was creating what he promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, a nation. He brings the people to the very edge, and they choose to disobey God and not go in. Unbelief. The lack of faith in their God was the key. They didn't trust their God, even though he had answered their prayers. Sent a deliverer, Moses. 
Even though God judged the Egyptians with 10 plagues, even though God protected them from the very same plagues, even though God delivered this generation with the greatest Old Testament miracle, the parting of the Red Sea, God brought them through and the army that was pursuing them drowned. God provided them with food, manna. God provided them with water. Yet everywhere they went, they were unthankful, constantly complaining, and did not trust God. Even when they saw these great miracles. Now, Picture yourself there. You see the miracles of God. Would you trust? And would you walk by faith? Because that's the challenge for us today. Trust God. Obey the word of God. Trust and obey. I hope we'll do that. So number four was the wilderness wanderings. After that, number five. What's the memory peg for five? Five dollar bill. What can you buy with cash? Judges. (laughs) That's the next period, the period of the judges. When Joshua died, God did not appoint a man. Joshua had brought them into the land. But when Joshua died, they did not appoint a man to succeed him as military and political leader. Instead, God chose various individuals from within the tribes to lead the tribes, and they were to unseat the inhabitants who lived in the land of Canaan, who had been there, and their wickedness was great. For example, they found ancient burials where they have just whole slew babies like one-year-old, which have been burned with fire. For the great evil that they did, God sentenced them to be ejected from their land. So God chose judges. The term judges means bringer of justice. And so they were appointed by God to bring justice. They're kind of like mayors of towns. They were leaders And sometimes they had to judge cases. And sometimes, not always, sometimes they were called upon to lead military campaigns against their enemies who were attacking them. The writer also described Yahweh as a judge in Judges. And this points to the fact that judges were God's agents in Israel who judged under him during this period in the nation's history. One of those judges is Samson. Here you see the picture of Samson knocking down the stone pillars with his great strength that God had given. The memory peg for number six is a monkey's tail. And what do you see on the head of the monkey? A crown. Yeah, a crown. So think of number six, the monkey's tail. Think of the monkey wearing a crown. This speaks of the United Kingdom, period. Now God had faced many, uh, God and his people had faced many trials together and the people became worried as they looked upon the surrounding nations, which were all mightier and more experienced in warfare than they were. And so they cried out to God, and they wanted God to give them a king. I believe this was God's intention. However, this was premature. But God heard their cries and gave them a king, Saul. After Saul, God appointed David, a man after God's own heart. And after David, his son Solomon reigned as well. Each reigned for about 40 years. Unfortunately, Solomon did not have 
a whole heart like David did. And that brings us to number seven. You remember the golf putter, upside down golf putter is the number seven? Well, imagine that falling down and splitting the crown in half. And this is the divided kingdom period. You see, Solomon, unlike his father, had a divided heart. And as a result, God divided the kingdom. Solomon's son, Rehoboam, got to lead two tribes, Benjamin and Judah. But God sent a prophet to a very capable individual named Jeroboam, very much a similar name to Rehoboam. But Jeroboam was chosen by God to lead the other nation the northern nation of Israel, 10 tribes. And so the prophet comes and tears up his cloak and lays it on the ground and tells Jeroboam, all right, pick 10. And he does. And those 10 pieces represented the 10 tribes he would lead. God told him, if you are faithful to me, I will bless you. However, Jeroboam was fearful for himself. He saw that people were leaving his nation going south, leaving the northern kingdom, going to the southern kingdom, to Jerusalem, which is where God said they should worship him. And when he saw that, he thought, boy, they're going to leave me. In fact, they'll probably even kill me. I better do something. And so here's what he did. He thought, instead of them going all the way, all that distance to worship in Jerusalem, I'll set up two calf idols. He did what? Aaron did, only he multiplied it. He created two, one in Bethel and the other down south. And so he had these two kingdoms, these two idols that they were to worship. And God was displeased with this. This brings us to period number eight, the Assyrian captivity period. Well, Jeroboam's story reminds us that if we learn one thing from history at all, it's that we learn nothing from history. The problem was probably that they didn't have the teaching of the Word of God. You had the two calves, one in the north and one in the south. And this caused God's people to turn away from worshiping God. Well, Jeroboam's reign lasted about 20 years, but his practice of worshiping at Dan and Bethel continued. The people and the kings worshiped these idols. There were about five dynasties, 19 kings, and not a single one of them worshiped Yahweh. All of them turned aside to worship false gods and led the people of these 10 tribes to do the same. Well, the wonderful thing about our God is that he is patient. I, I struggle with this because I look at this and I say, God, why did you let it go on? I think we know the reason. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He was patient with them. For a long, long time, 19 kings, finally, he said, I've sent you prophets, you have Moses, but you have rejected me. And so he sent an enemy, a very, very powerful enemy, the Assyrians. The Assyrians were the big bubbas on the block. <laughs> they had been a powerhouse for 1,200 years, actually longer. And this people were known to make their living by invading other nations. They would come in and they would take everything. They would take your grain, they would take your cattle, your herds, your flocks, everything. And so when people saw the Assyrians coming, what would they do? They'd leave their fields and they'd go into the city behind the walls. They'd close the gates and they would hunker down. And they're trying to wait out the siege. But the Assyrians who created the siege towers 
would come and conquer the city. And the way this was described to me by the person who taught to me in Bible college was the first two people out of the city, once they had conquered the city, would say, they would say, the commander would say, you stand there. Everyone else would be brought out and killed. Some would be skinned alive. Others were impaled. A pole would be stuck up their abdomen and they would be left hanging on that to die a gruesome death. And then the commander would say to these two people that watched all of that, okay, you, go to the next city and tell them we're coming. And they would go to the next city, and they would tell the people. And here's what the Assyrians were hoping to accomplish. The people would just give up without a fight. They thought, we're going to die if we fight. We'll live if we give them everything. And this way, the Assyrians avoided the loss and the expense and the time it would take to conquer that city. And that's how they survived all those centuries. And God brought them to the northern tribe of Israel. In that particular case, they deported the people around the empire. Well, for a while, the southern kingdom had some good in it. For example, Hezekiah was a good and godly king. He's exalted as a model. He followed after David who worshiped God with a whole heart. But in time, they grew worse and worse. They even got to be where they were worse than the northern kingdom. And so God brings about the fall of Jerusalem and the Babylonian captivity period. Remember number nine, memory peg number nine, it's a periscope. So envision the shaft and the ocular piece makes the nine. Well, here's how we can remember this. Number nine, we have uh, a person looking through the periscope. And what does the person looking through the periscope see? A baby. This is the Babylonian captivity period. All right, a little corny, but believe it or not, I remember it. <laughs> All right. Here is the reason and the result the reason and result for judgment, 2 Kings 21. The Lord said through his servants, the prophets, since King Manasseh of Judah, southern kingdom, has committed all these detestable acts, worse evil than the Amorites who preceded him had done, and by means of his idols has also caused Judah to sin. This is what the Lord God of Israel says. I'm about to bring such a disaster on Jerusalem and Judah that everyone who hears it will shudder. I will wipe Jerusalem clean as one wipes a bowl, wiping it and turning it upside down. I will abandon the remnant of my inheritance and hand them over to their enemies. They will become plunder and spoil to all their ancestors. I'm sorry, to all their enemies, because they have done what was evil in my sight and have angered me from the day their ancestors came out of Egypt until today. If that wasn't bad enough, there's one more reason that the writer gives for this judgment was murder. Manasseh also shed so much innocent blood that he filled Jerusalem with it from one end to the other. Now here's the result. Exile. The exile was to last for 70 years. Well, since there were several 
different times when kings came and took the people away, it's hard to know with absolute assurance which one it was. I'm thinking it was, and this is common, 605 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar, that famous king, came to Jerusalem and deported a massive number of people to Babylon. Guess what? Seventy years later, a different kingdom now in control of all this area, the Medes and Persians, King Cyrus, I believe moved by the hand of God, makes a decree. That decree is recorded in Ezra chapter 1. And he makes a decree, and he says, all the people, all God's people, all the Jews may return to their homeland. And he even authorizes money to cover their expenses, to travel there, and to set up sacrifices when they get there. God's hand was at work. God was faithful. And so what we're describing here is the post-captivity period. Remember, the memory peg is what? Ten little Indians, right? Okay, so imagine ten Indians sitting on top of a post. This is the post-captivity period. (laughs) It's a big event. It's a return to the land. I like it that the Old Testament ends generally on an upbeat note. You know, a good parent may say to her child, you've been bad, you're in time out. But there's always an end to that, right? That good parent, she will say it's time to end the punishment. You're free. And that's what God did. He ended the punishment after 70 years. He brought the people back. They were able to reestablish worship and connection with their God, this time not worshiping false idols. God's purpose all along was to teach and to help his people get back where they needed to be. My goal in going through all this is to help you have an understanding of the flow of the Old Testament. When I was about three years old in the faith, I came to faith about age 20. When I was about 23, somebody taught me this lesson. He was teaching memory techniques, and he had these 10 periods, and he just, to demonstrate it, happened to attach the periods of the Old Testament. And here, all these years later, I still remember that. And I'm giving it to you. And I'm hoping... Here is my great, awesome goal. I'm hoping you, all of you, will teach this to someone else. I believe you can do it. By the way, I've already sent you these 10 slides. (laughs) And if you look on the back of your bulletin, you're going to see the 10 periods written out. So you've got this information. Now, you don't have to teach them all the information I gave today, just the 10 periods. So I'm going to ask you one more time to go through that with me. Are you ready? What's the first memory peg? Pen. What's on the top of the pen? What period? Beginnings. Number two, coat hanger. What period? Patriarchal period. Number three, tricycle. Pharaoh's riding it, the Egyptian period. Number four is a car, dune buggy. Yeah. (laughs) Wilderness wanderings. Number five, what can you buy with a $5 bill? Judges, period of judges. Number six, Unky's Tale, good. United Kingdom. Number seven, upside down golf putter. Divided Kingdom, breaks that crown into two, north and south, Israel and Judah. What's next? Number eight, eight ball. 
the Assyrian captivity period. Think of that eight ball barreling in to knock the gates down. Number nine, periscope. The Babylonian captivity period, yeah. <laughs> and number 10, 10 little Indians on a post, the post-captivity period. See, you can do this. And if you teach somebody else, who always learns the most? <laughs> the teacher, right? And if you teach somebody else, this will reinforce this in your minds. And you may teach it to somebody who winds up understanding the Old Testament. And then they may teach it to somebody else. And maybe we will start a flood of understanding of the Word of God. So right now, think about who you might teach. Maybe a neighbor. Maybe a friend, co-worker at business, but don't do it on the clock. Well, pastor, I really don't know who I could do it. Well, if you're married, teach it to your spouse. <laughs> teach it to your grandkid. Boy, I can think of a number of you that would be able to do that. And finally, if you don't have anybody else, teach it to me or one of the elders, okay? I'm asking you to do this. This is a challenge, but I think in about 15, maybe 20 minutes, you can go through all this, the 10 memory pegs and then the 10 periods, and they can learn it, and you will know it. Father God, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you, Father, for the revelation that you have given to us. The Old Testament is a mystery, but it's unlocked by these 10 periods. I pray, Father, that we would grasp this and we would be able to remember it and Father we would go forward and teach it because Father you have called us to be disciples who make disciples we pray in your son's name Amen Thank you, Pastor Mark. I knew there was going to be some sort of quiz. But the quiz time is over and the singing time is back. So stand with me. We're going to sing Shout to the Lord. Yeah. 
for you. Thank you, worship team. We've got some great people here. And I just want to read to you something we got from a church member. I got it this morning. It's from Martha Mason. If you've been following us, um, she fell down and she broke her leg just below the hip. It required immediate surgery. And she is back home, praise God, with Stuart and Michelle. And she sent us a card. Imagine that. She just broke her leg and she's sending us an encouraging card. <laughs> Dear church family, your cards, you, some of you have sent cards to her, your cards brighten my days and strengthen my spirit. Your prayers help me through each day. Thank you. Thank you. In one of my daily devotional readings, the message was about encouraging church members. That was what you extend to me and my family. What a gift we have as believers, atonement for our sins and assurance of life everlasting through Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. I believe we are meant to share this gift as often as we can, wherever we are, with whomever we meet. Someone always needs a smile or a compliment, recognition, and encouragement. I know more than ever from this time that God has lessons for us to learn, even in one's 80s. Again, thank you for caring and sharing. And I pray that Oak Hills will continue to be a group of believing encouragers. God bless each and every one of you and keep you safe. Martha Mason. Tremendous encouragement. There's also one more encouragement, one that I find a true blessing. Last week, Jim and Sherry Johnson met with the elders and shared their personal testimony of faith in Christ. And what a joy it was to hear your testimonies. Just encouraging. And so we are welcoming Jim and Sherry. Jim and Sherry, would you come up here on this side? and be there to greet people. Now, we're not going to shake hands. I have seen people welcome people with a warm embrace, a bear hug. But in the days of COVID, we're trying to be wise. So I'm going to ask you to give them a, a friendly word, a wave. No bear hugs. <laughs> okay. Jim and Sherry, thank you so much for joining our church. Would you please welcome them? And I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to ask you guys to file around this way and come through. Father God, we thank you for new members. Lord, what a joy to meet Jim and Sherry. What a joy to see how you have worked in their lives. What a joy to hear their testimony. Father, I pray your blessings upon them as they become part of our fellowship. Father, may they be encouraged by us, and we, may we reciprocate and encourage them. Thank you, Father for this new couple. Amen. All right, if you will come on around on this side and do kind of a drive-by wave. <laughs> <laughs>